Welcome everyone to the first semester of 2021, or better, the first seminar of our delayed 2020 B semester. Today we restart the series and we uh, go almost non-stop till the end of May with amazing speakers from around the globe, of course, given the constraints in time zones. Please check our, out our list of talks in the department's webpage. We're also posting the link in the chat. When possible, we try to follow your suggestions and have tried to keep the list of speakers as diverse as we could. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Kuhn, today's speaker. Mike is currently a postdoc at Caltech in California, the United States, where he works with Lion Hildebrand and, other, and others interested in young stellar objects and star formation. He has been using a lot of Gaia data but has also been working with light curves from the Zwicky Transient Facility and doing some X-ray astronomy, the wavelength he was originally trained in. He did his undergrad degree at Swar Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, where he gained interest in both X-ray astronomy and young stellar objects, working with David Cohen and e Eric Jensen. He went on and got his PhD from Penn State University in 2014, where he was co-advised by Konstantin Getman and Eric Feigelson, who also got him hooked in astrostatistics. His first postdoc was as a Fondisit fellow in Chile, where he worked with the Young Star Cluster Group in Valparaiso. And finally, in 2018, he started his current postdoctoral position at Caltech. Thank you so much, Mike, for accepting our invitation. You may start when you're ready. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Anna, for the introduction and for arranging uh, everything. And thank you all for uh, attending this uh, talk. So today I'm going to talk about how the life cycle of star forming regions affects the young stellar clusters and stellar associations that get produced. And I'm going to talk about how observations uh, of these regions uh, using uh, multi-wavelength uh, data can uh, help inform uh, theoretical models for kind of the larger scale structures of the life cycles of these regions. So uh, I'm going to highlight some work by several groups that I've been involved with. One is uh, the massive star formation uh, team at Penn State who, uh, were, who, who have done this project called Mystics that I'm going to show a few results from. This uses is primarily uh, X-ray and with some uh, and infrared with some optical information. And the background image here is kind of an illustration of the sort of data that this project worked with. Uh, in purple, you can see the X-ray observation, which highlights the stars, and then uh, the Spitzer image uh, shows lots of nebulosity around this region. This is the flame nebula in the Orion uh, complex. Um, lately, I've been working with people at Caltech on projects involving uh, young stellar objects. And I'm also going to highlight some work that was done along with the Cosmos Statistics Initiative, uh, which uh, aims to uh, solve problems in astronomy using in statistics and informatics methods. So I'm going to motivate some of the uh, observations uh, with problem, current problems in star formation. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, identifying young stars in star forming regions, uh, kinematics of the star clusters and associations using Gaia, then zooming in on one particular region, I'm going to focus on connecting the stellar kinematics to the gas. And then I'm going to conclude by uh, relating the observational constraints to theory and seeing what this can uh, tell us. So the basics of star formation, so to motivate things, uh, I want to admit, briefly summarize the basics of star formation. So stars form in molecular clouds, which are the coldest, densest phase of the interstellar medium. And these clouds can have masses of tens of thousands to uh, millions of solar masses. Um, and they span large portions of the galaxy. They're quite cold. And this means that the sound speed uh, tends to be uh, only a few tenths of a kilometer per second. And one consequence of this is that the turbulence in the clouds is moderately supersonic. 
So in these clouds, star formation occurs when you end up with uh, sufficiently massive uh, density fluctuations that can start to collapse. And uh, this is, of course, called the uh, genes mass. And these fluctuations can be seeded by this supersonic turbulence. And uh, because of, the, of these above uh, star formation events, both where and when stars form are very closely tied to the evolution of the molecular clouds. And some important parameters that are used in a lot of the theories for explaining, trying to explain uh, star formation in molecular clouds are the free fall time scale, which is the amount of time a cloud would take to collapse under uh, gravity, which is related to the density of the cloud, and also the star formation efficiency. And in most of these molecular clouds, star formation efficiency is rather low only. Only a small fraction of the mass in the cloud ends up getting converted into stars by each one of these events. So uh, to show how this all looks like in practice, this is the Orion region. This is just an optical picture, I believe, taken by an amateur astronomer, uh, but scaled so you can see the nebulosity. And uh, there is a complex made of several molecular clouds. Uh, and within these clouds, you have different sites of star formation throughout the whole region, ranging from the famous Orion Nebula cluster here. This is an HST image of the Orion Nebula and up through Lambda Oriate, which is a more distributed star formation site. Here's the Flame Nebula, uh, another site, massive cluster. And there's stars forming throughout these regions. And many of the recent uh, Gaia-based studies have uh, have revealed uh, the complex distribution of stars, along with the, uh, which, uh, along with other complex things that you can see in the gas, uh, both nebulosity and the uh, molecular clouds. Um, if you take a look at a, a cluster like this, just in the optical, it might be harder to see stars, but it, when you go to other wavelengths like the infrared, you start to see through the cloud and you can identify many more uh, stars. So uh, most stars are formed in, uh, are not formed in isolation, but formed in clustered environments. These might aren't necessarily bound stellar clusters. And in the majority of cases, uh, the clusters do, the, the systems don't survive as bound clusters, but end up being distributed. Uh, dissolving into uh, the field uh, after the end of star formation. So one of the questions is uh, that we want to address is what systems end up forming bound clusters and what systems end up getting distributed. And understanding the demographics of uh, clustered star formation can be easier uh, in other galaxies where we get a nice face on view, uh, but it's in the nearest star forming regions within our own galaxy that we can get the best detailed view of the kinematics of what's going on and the relation between the stars and the gas. But one disadvantage of looking in our own galaxy is that we're looking edge on into the disk. This is an image from Spitzer's glimpse survey. And one of the complications with this is that you can get multiple structures at different distances that line up on the same line of sight. And so it can be complicated to disentangle these structures and get uh, a good view of uh, the distribution of stars in a particular star forming region. So several important questions are, what is the star form formation rate? Do stars form on, do stars form quickly? For example, on a single free fall collapse time scale of a cloud or do they form slowly maybe over multiple collapse time scales if uh, the clouds are supported by uh, turbulence, uh, for example. Also, what is the star formation efficiency in a particular cloud? And how is uh, feedback from star formation uh, affecting this? And then what conditions do you need for bound clusters? We know that most of these massive star forming regions don't end up forming a bound cluster. So which ones do and what conditions do you need to form that? 
So uh, one of the first steps in doing this, which uh, seems obvious but is non-trivial to do, is selecting the young stars. Um, and this is difficult because in many of these regions you have high extinctions, which limit what you can do in the optical, optical there's high nebulosity, and then numerous field stars, making it difficult to distinguish which ones are young and which ones just happen to be uh, field stars along the same lines of sight. So I've listed a number of uh, selection criteria that are often used to identify candidate young stellar objects uh, in studies and surveys of these regions. Uh, many of them are require optical uh, observations, uh, but then two additional uh, criteria can be infrared excess and X-ray emission. And I've included a cartoon here that kind of uh, explains these two. If you have uh, a lot of young stars have uh, circumstellar disks around them, and uh, these will reprocess radiation from the star, star into the infrared and create a large infrared excess. And so that can be used to pick out stars. But of course, you need to, uh, it only works for stars with uh, disks, and you would need to be able to disentangle this from other sources with infrared excess. Uh, X ray emission is another. Uh, method that can be used. And um, uh, young stars are magnetically active. Magnetic reconnection can heat the corona of the star to tens of millions of degrees Kelvin, uh, temperatures at which it emits X rays. And these X rays are much, uh, this X ray emission is much higher by uh, many orders of magnitude than X ray emission from main sequence stars like our Sun. And so it uh, really can highlight young stars. So as an example, this is the core of a massive star forming region shown both in the infrared and X-ray. Um, the objects that were selected using infrared excess are marked with the red circles. Uh, in this image, some of these are can be a bit hard to see, but then these are objects uh, identified in the X-ray. And in this particular region, almost all of the X-ray sources happen to be young stars. And you can see that in dense cores of embedded star forming regions, X-rays often give a less biased picture of where the stars are within the infrared. So uh, to start with a, an example, this is NGC 6231. This is not, uh, this is a cluster that's part of a larger uh, stellar association. You can kind of, this is an optical image and you can kind of see, uh, the association here. Uh, it's long and filamentary, but you can clearly see the densest location within the association, which is this cluster. And uh, there are large numbers of field stars, uh, which made it historically difficult to distinguish uh, members of this cluster from the background. So the X-ray observations of this, uh, both done by our group and also by uh, the group led by uh, Damiani, uh, we're able to increase the number of known members of this by a factor of uh, nearly five. Uh, this is an image of a Chandra image of the cluster, and you can see the young stars really popping out in this image. So, although this is this cluster is part of this more diffuse association, uh, based on the Chandra data, uh, we modeled the surface density distribution within this cluster. You can see numbers of stars per square parsec versus uh, spatial position. And it's a fairly smooth, uh, nice centrally peaked distribution. And it's quite well described by a fairly simplistic uh, cluster model profile. But in many star forming regions, uh, the distributions are a lot more complicated. Uh, this is NGC 6357. Uh, this is a Spitzer image. And Spitzer really highlights uh, the nebulosity in these regions. And you can see that it's dominated by this bubble-like uh, structure. Uh, in contrast, the objects identified as young stars are uh, form these uh, central, centrally uh, dense uh, clusters. And you can see that there are clearly multiple clusters within this complex. Uh, one in this bubble, another 
in this bubble and another in this bubble. And these have, uh, so it, this makes it harder to describe the structure. Uh, we tried modeling these with uh, different, the sum of different cluster models uh, as a statistical mixture model. And uh, this actually ends up producing pretty well describing the surface density distributions in this, uh, in this region. But you can get quite a lot of diversity in structure. And so from the uh, Mystics project uh, conducted at Penn State, uh, we took a look at a number of different regions uh, using X-ray and infrared observations. And we went, uh, we've applied corrections to try to, try to get uh, less biased estimates of surface density because different observations can have different sensitivities. So we've tried to correct this and put them all on the same uh, intrinsic surface density scale. And these also, these images are also shown with the same spatial scales. So this can highlights the surface density distributions in many different star forming regions. And you can see quite a bit of diversity. Uh, in a region like Orion, you have this, the Orion Nebula cluster, you have this dense central cluster. But of course, this is part of a, a more complex star forming region. And then other cases like 6357, which I just showed, you have three fairly distinct clusters. In some cases, you have chains of clusters. NGC 6334 are uh, chains of uh, subclusters of young stars that are deeply embedded in a molecular cloud. But on the other hand, the region NGC 1893 is also a chain of subclusters, but the cloud has mostly been dispersed. And then you have these clusters of clusters like the Greater Carina Nebula shown here. So overall, there's a lot of diversity. And this uh, structure is going to have some impact on the evolution of these regions um, and whether or not you can form a bound cluster or uh, if the stars disperse. So one way to study this is through simulations, at least to make predictions. But these simulations are very sensitive to the initial conditions you use and the assumptions about uh, what's going on with the gas, which can be hard to uh, figure out. So this is one simulation uh, based on some of our uh, observations. And this was done by Allison Sills et al. And in this simulation, it makes uh, the gas, there's not much strong feedback effects on the gas. So it fairly smoothly and slowly flows out from the cluster. So in this particular scenario, you end up with these subclusters. And then uh, the gravitational forces of the stars and gas cause them to all coalesce, uh, merging with each other. And you end up with a bound cluster. Uh, that, and here you can see that there's some expansion of it uh, rebounding after uh, these subclusters merged. Uh, and this was all done uh, pre-Gaia. So what's going on here? Uh, uh, we can take a look, use simulations like this to make predictions for what you would see if you were to investigate the kinematics in regions like this. Um, the, this is the, these are simulations at what's going on in the simulation as you go through uh, 10 million years. The mergers mostly happen in the first few million years. And this is the radial velocity. So you start with uh, stars streaming in. So the mean median radial velocity is negative uh, up till you get to the densest point where you have a bit of rebounding effect and you get expansion up to about half a kilometer per second. At this point, the velocity dispersion in the radial direction is maximized, but then it ends up settling down and you get uh, a steady state bound cluster. Um, however, uh, the, so a key parameter is the virial parameter, which is related to the mass and the radius of the cluster and also the cluster's structure. And you would expect 
uh, stars that are in equilibrium to have velocity dispersions near the virial uh, parameter. Uh, if the velocity dispersion is lower, then a system would be expected to end up collapsing. And if it's higher, then you would end up having it eventually expand. But also, depending on uh, the efficiency of star formation, you can end up with, a after a cloud is dispersed, you can end up with uh, a different virial relate uh, ratio, and you can even end up with a cloud that is not a an association that is not bound and ends up dispersing. So there have been a number of studies to understand how different star formation efficiencies affect uh, whether a cluster is formed, and also how the spatial relations between the stars and the gas affect things. So Gaia has been very helpful for testing this because. With the proper motions that you get from Gaia, you can actually start to look at how stars are moving within a uh, within a young stellar cluster or association. Uh, there have been a lot of papers on this topic coming out since the DR2 release, but now we have the DR3 release, and so new improved uh, results should be coming out uh, from uh, from studies that use these data. So I'm going to highlight some uh, DR2-based release, uh, DR2-based results. So this is some work that, uh, that we did looking at uh, young stellar clusters or at uh, groups of stars in massive star forming regions. So this is the Orion Nebula cluster and this is uh, NGC 6530 in the Lagoon Nebula. And after, you can convert the proper motions, taking into account some geometric uh, effects into projected tangential velocities of stars. So you, uh, if you have radial velocities, you can get 3D motions of the stars, but Gaia at least gives you 2D motions. And this is enough to uh, tell whether something is uh, expanding or not. So in just from the vectors, it can be hard to see what's going on, but here, the motions of stars are color coded by the direction they're moving in. And in the case of Orion, you can see that uh, stars are moving any which way. Maybe there's a preferential mo motion up or down, but it doesn't look like there's any expansion or contraction of the region. But in the NGC 6530 region, you can see this co color gradient going around. And stars that are at the north side of it tend to be moving towards the north. Stars that are at the south side tend to be more moving towards the south. On the east side, they're moving east. On the west side, they're moving west. So they're expanding. And this pattern is seen in a lot of different star forming regions. Uh, uh, overall, preferentially, the stars are moving outward, which is uh, which confirms that the system is expanding. And if you look at the outward velocity versus uh, distance from the center of the cluster, uh, there's this linear uh, pattern. And this is seen in many star forming regions uh, it, where the stars in the outer regions are moving out uh, more quickly. So in, out, of a, out of a sample of about 28 systems that we examined, uh, 21 of them uh, have expansion. And um, one could ask, what's the, if, what's the effect of uncertainties on these? So we tried modeling this with uh, a Bayesian model. And this suggests that uh, the effects of errors is to make the signal uh, smaller. So from this, we conclude that at least uh, Seventy-five percent of the systems are expanding, but it could be more. And several of them are are expanding with very high statistical uh, significance. But in the sample that we examined with Gaia, because the stars have to be optically visible, these are mostly systems where the cloud has been uh, partially dispersed. Um, you can do similar uh, tests for rotation, and in our sample, we found very little evidence for rotation. Uh, which is interesting because a number of theoretical studies 
uh, have uh, found that if you have a cluster that's built up out of the merger of subclusters, you might expect it to be rotating. But this is not something that we found in most of the cases. Uh, we also uh, examined the velocity dispersions, comparing it to what you would expect for a virialized cluster, and found in most cases uh, the the observed velocity dispersions are larger than you would expect for a virialized cluster. So this implies that most of these systems are dynamically hot. And uh, these are color coded by whether the cluster is embedded in the cloud. And most of the embedded ones red here tend not to be expanding as much, but the, but the uh, systems in that are partially revealed or where the cloud has been totally dispersed uh, are more likely to be expanding faster. So this does suggest that cloud dispersal has some uh, role in this. There are a few cases that don't seem to be uh, expanding in an unbound way. Uh, for example, the Orion Nebula cluster, not the whole region, but just the densest core of the trapezium uh, does not appear to be uh, uh, appears to be consistent with what you would expect for the velocity dispersions in a virialized uh, system. So there are a number of different possibilities for expansion. It's likely related to the dispersal of the cloud, but there can be several different explanations. One is that the stars are just uh, die born hot. And eventually in a system like this, uh, the stars will disperse and they'll end up with radial velocities directed away from the center. But uh, you could also have a cluster that starts out virialized and ends up being dispersed when the cloud, uh, when material binding mass from the cloud that binds the cluster is dispersed and, the, and you end up with a unbound association. Another possibility that has been investigated quite a bit by Diederich uh, Kreisen and his group is that if you have a bound cluster, uh, it can be tidally disrupted by mass from a nearby molecular cloud. Uh, and another possibility is if you have an expanding shell, uh, if you have triggered star formation within the shell, then uh, they can pick up the velocities of the shell and end up forming stars that have an expanding pattern. An intriguing recent study by simulation by Zamora uh, Avilas et al. Uh, kind of combine some of these. And in their case, they have a cluster uh, where you have feedback from a massive star that blows out the material in the cloud. But then this means that the potential energy, the uh, lowest potential energy in the system is where you have the cloud. And so that, uh, which is outside the cluster, and it ends up pulling the cluster apart. So it's so a bit of a variant on the tidal disruption. So this is an intriguing thing to investigate. So now in the uh, uh, last few minutes of this talk, I'm, I want to focus on a specific star forming region, uh, looking more in more detail at trying to understand the origin of the expansion and the kinematics within the region. This is the North Amer American Nebula. This is a picture by uh, uh, by, I guess, an amateur astronomer that was recently featured on APOD. Uh, it's called the North American Nebula because the shape of this vaguely re resembles the shape of North America with the Gulf of Mexico here and the Atlantic uh, up here. I guess this is Pacific over here. This region over here is called the Pelican Nebula. And these are all part of, part of one star forming region with most of the activity going on in this rift between them that is dark because of the location of uh, the cloud. So uh, these, the points here are objects that were identified as young stars and uh, whose distance ha distances have been confirmed consistent with the region by Gaia. If you look at the position of the stars in right ascension versus proper motion, and also do the same versus using declination versus proper motion and declination, you can see that 
uh, this can be subdivided into a number of different groups, which includes both the spatial information, but also the kinematic information in proper motion. Like you, this group here is both spatially distinct, but also has a different proper motion from these other groups. So using this information to subdivide it, these can divide, be divided into about six different groups, which are color coded here. And correlations between the proper motion and position are what you would expect from expansion. So this big green group here called group D uh, appears to be one with the most extreme expansion. But uh, other groups have slightly different proper motions and you don't see a clear expansion pattern over the entire region, but instead it appears to be that the expansion is going on within the individual groups, but not in the system as a whole. Uh, there are two uh, O stars in the region. The Bahamar star is this one. Uh, it's one of these green points down here. Uh, it's a very early star. Um, the earliest that has uh, where a spectral type of O3.5 has been uh, found. There may be some uncertainty in the spectral classification. So uh, future spectroscopy should uh, confirm it, but it's a very early O-type star. Then there's another O-type star that's at the periphery of the region. And this star is generally as assumed to be the one that's causing, that's ionizing the whole system. So if we zoom in on this, uh, this group D here, we can see the velocity vectors in projection and things tend to be moving away from the center. So this is a very clear case of expansion. And we can model this to understand uh, the velocity gradients within this. So it appears that there's a velocity gradient of about 0.3 to 0.5 kilometers per second per parsec. Um, and uh, along one axis, it's about 0.5. And along the other axis, it's about 0.3. So it's expanding more in this east-west direction than it is in the north-south direction. So this means it's not isotropic expansion. It's not like a Hubble flow sort of thing, but there's a little bit of anisotropy to this. Uh, the maximum velocities of expansion are about eight kilometers per second. And this is, these are the velocity vectors for the stars plotted on top of uh, the region. And you can see that these different groups are moving in different directions in projection on the sky. Uh, and here are these two O-type stars. Uh, the O3 point stars, 3.5 star is moving rather fast in that direction. So although it appears to be located in this Gulf of Mexico region, if you trace back its velocity, it should have originated closer to the northern portion of the cluster in likely within group D. And the same with HD 199579. It's also moving very fast. It's one of the uh, fastest moving members of the whole association but tracing it back would have placed it near the center of group D. So both the O-type stars uh, appear to be getting ejected out of, uh, out of this group at about six kilometers per second. So the, uh, we've taken a look at the uh, gas in this region to try to understand how this is tied in with the uh, kinematics of the stars. And these are, uh, these are 13 CO observations taken over several of different velocity ranges. So this is the uh, gas moving towards us fastest. And uh, it's this long filament, but then as you uh, go to the next step in velocity range, you have this a very different sort of structure, maybe with a bit of a shell-like structure in the north. Uh, there's a paper by Zhang 2014 who relate this shell structure to uh, a bubble produced by uh, feedback from the O star. And then if you go even farther in velocity, uh, you get to the gas associated with the Gulf of Mexico region. So 
<clears throat> uh, it's a bit difficult to parse, but we identified the main cloud components and looked at the velocity dispersions here. You have velocity on the uh, X axis. And there's a lot of multimodal structure uh, to this, but these different uh, cloud components seem to tend to have different velocities. And from the velocity dispersion uh, and making a lot of assumptions about uh, the clouds, you can estimate a virial mass for these clouds. And then uh, you can also integrate uh, the 13CO emission and making more assumptions, you can use this to estimate uh, a mass uh, from the integrated emission. And when we compare these, uh, these seem to be in pretty good agreement with each other. So if the dynamical masses are correlated with the, uh, with the cloud masses, this suggests that the velocity dispersions in the clouds are at least in some way related to gravity. Uh, if you have material free falling into the cluster, then, uh, then they pick up velocity as they fall in and you would get this sort of velocity dispersion. Alternatively, if you have a, a I mean, if you have a cloud in virial equilibrium, you would also expect it to be related to uh, the mass of the, the velocity dispersion to be related to the mass of the cloud, both of which are what we see. And although these end up with slightly different velocities, uh, the systematic effect on estimating mass are large enough that it's hard to distinguish between these two, but at least uh, the velocity dispersions appear to be related to the masses of these cloud components. And also, if you take a look at the relative velocities of the different clouds in the system as a whole, uh, the velocity dispersions there can be fully explained by, uh, by gravitation. So then if we combine the view of the stars and the view of the gas. This is an optical picture, but I'm going to overlay the uh, cloud molecular cloud image that I just showed, and then overlay on top of that uh, the stars. You can see that these different stellar groups identified based on the kinematics of the stars within the group tend to be associated with di different cloud components. For example, these stars over here are all moving in that direction uh, to the right. And they seem to be associated with this cloud component. Meanwhile, this cloud component seems to be associated with a group of stars moving to, towards the north. The Gulf of Mexico uh, cloud is associated with these stars. And then uh, the stars shown in blue seem to be associated with clouds two and three. And then it's a little bit, this big group uh, shown by the green arrows, it's a bit hard to figure out which cloud it's associated with. It might be associated with cloud eight, but it's also kind of located within this uh, shell up here. But then based on these associations, you can start to assume that uh, the stars are picking up their velocities from the initial velocities of the clouds. And with that, you can make a start making a 3D picture of star formation in a region like this. Uh, with, with Gaia, both DR2 and DR3, the variations in parallax to these different groups are different enough that you can uh, see some three-dimensional structure in distance. For example, the Gulf of Mexico cloud has a statistically uh, larger parallax than most of the other regions. And so that implies that this is about 35 parsecs closer. Meanwhile, this group up here uh, has a significantly smaller parallax than other groups, meaning that it's probably in the background. And then combining the proper motions of the stars and the motions of the clouds, you can also get a three-dimensional picture of the velocities. So these are the median uh, projected velocities of, the, uh, of these groups uh, as shown by the arrows and the cloud uh, and the radial velocities are indicated by these values. And there's no systematic pattern here. So uh, although there's very clear expansion within the individual groups, the system at a, as a whole is not expanding. So this 
overall system is, uh, seems unlikely to produce a down cluster because the velocity dispersions are too high, but uh, the expansion is seen within the individual groups, but not this system as a whole. So then what happens to a system after like this, after the end of star formation? Oh, formation. But first I want to point out one additional aspect of this, which is that uh, this is work by Min Feng et al. And uh, they did spectroscopy for a large number of the stars in this region and find that when you put these on the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, most of them are consistent with being about 1 million years old. And very few of them are, have ages greater than about 3 million years old. So the population of stars is very young. Um, so uh, this age of about one to three million years is similar to the free fall time scales for the individual cloud components. So this implies that in this region, the stars are, should be forming it following a, a rapid star formation scenario where you do get star formation on approximately the free fall time of the clouds and there isn't any effect that's slowing down star formation uh, particularly. Another intriguing thing is, so the distances between the clouds are on the order of tens of, tens of parsecs. And the sound speed is only a few ten, tenths of a kilometer per second, meaning that the sound crossing time for a region like this is about 100 mega years. However, the stars are only in these widely separated regions are only uh, a few mega years old rather than a hundred mega years. So this means that uh, star formation has somehow synchronized across this large region much faster than information could travel across the region, which is rather curious. So one possible explanation for this is that if in a system like this, if you have an accelerating star formation rate as the uh, clouds get built up, then most of the stars would have formed near the, near the present because the star formation rate is increasing. And so uh, star formation, so most stars form at the maximum where the star formation rate is at the maximum, which is nearest the present day. And this could help synchronize star formation across a large region like this. And there've been a number of scenarios that have been de developed for a system like this. So what happens to unbound young stellar groups? Uh, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but there have been a number of studies looking at older systems. And it, from Gaia, uh, it does look like if you look at older stellar populations in the galaxy, you can see many fossils of unbound systems uh, that remain after the end of star formation uh, for, uh, for many uh, tens or hundreds uh, hundreds of millions of years. And even uh, bound clusters uh, often are associated with a large unbound uh, population that is co-moving with them. So the last thing I want to show it, highlight is a new uh, catalog that uh, we have released. This was work done by the uh, Cosmos Statistics Initiative, uh, providing a list of candidate young stellar objects derived from uh, the glimpse survey. Um, this is based on uh, statistical classification uh, methodology to try to do a more complete, uh, obtain a more complete census of young stars in glimpse uh, than uh, have been available previously. And so we're hoping to use this in conjunction with Gaia data to try to uh, understand uh, both the clustered and also the distributed populations of young stars in the galaxy. So just to conclude, uh, recent work uh, involving Gaia from our group and uh, a lot of other groups have shown that uh, expansion of young stellar groups is very common. There's little observation of yet for the hierarchical mergers of uh, groups to form bound clusters. Um, gas and stars tend to be uh, co-moving. And um, in many cases, including the North America re 
nebula region, but also many other regions. You have star formation that seems to be synchronized in, uh, in widely separated clouds. So this is something that uh, models for star formation are going to have to deal with. So uh, with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk, Mike. For the people following the talk on YouTube, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please post them in the YouTube channel chat and our speaker will answer them later. Stay tuned and follow Astro Woodgis in our social media for the next events. Goodbye.